Luke chapter 4, verse 46. The people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness, and laying his hands on each one, he healed them. The word of God. Be God. Please be seated. A nice short scripture for a long sermon. We are in the sermon series called Be Well, where we look at some of our Seventh-day Adventist distinctive doctrines. We have 28 fundamental beliefs. These are beliefs that guide us as a church in our, uh, uh, in our belief, in our behavior, uh, and in our Christian walk with God. These fundamental beliefs are guidelines. They're not set in stone. In fact, in the preamble of the fundamental beliefs, it says that these can be changed in business session every five years. And they have started out with three informal way back in the 1800s, went up to the 23, 27, 28. It went down at a time. Right now we're at 28. So we're looking today at the distinctive um, fundamental belief about the health message. The health message. And I'm sure you're excited to be here for it. <laughs> I don't know what your first, um, what first comes to your mind when I say Adventist health message. I'll, I'll just have you all say it out loud at the count of three. Just say what you think of that first comes to your mind when you word, hear the words Adventist health message. Ready? One, two, three. I heard haystacks. Okay, lots of things. For many people it is what we don't eat, what we don't drink, what we don't do, right? <laughs> Although haystacks are pretty awesome. My first, um, my first interaction with the Ministry of Healing from Ellen G. White, one of the co-founders of our church, was uh, in my first year of college. I did not actually go to college at first to study to become a pastor. I didn't know what I wanted to do, so I enrolled in the University of Stellenbosch in South Africa, where I'm from. Public university, 30,000 students there. I enrolled for computer science and psychology or something like that. I didn't, I didn't know what I wanted to do. So, uh, in the first couple of weeks, I was taking Psychology 101, uh, and it's a massive class with probably about four or 500 students in it, this amphitheater-style kind of class that you see in movies. Um, and we were just going about our business. One of my friends, David Ings, uh, he was in class with me. He went to the University of Stambosch also, happened to take Psychology 101, and out of 30,000 people, two people from a small school, Seventh day Adventist school in the same class. And so we would sit together, uh, take notes together, have class together. And um, the professor was going through <clears throat> this is psychology, various kinds of topics. And the one day he was talking about uh, hypnosis. And we thought that this was interesting. Um, and uh, he said, next week we're going to be doing a class on hypnosis. My friend and, my, uh, and I, uh, we went down to speak to the professor about something. I forget exactly what it was. It was something that he mentioned in the lecture, and we were just asking questions. There were a couple of students hanging about the professor, and the professor then asked us, David and myself, whether we would be willing to be part of a hypnosis experiment the following week. I, of course, didn't say anything, and my friend said, yes, <laughs> and volunteered the two of us. I was like, oh my goodness, what do we do? My friend is English speaking, I'm Afrikaans speaking. This is an Afrikaans university, and as the professor talks to us, he says, here's what I want you to do for next week. I want you to come to class, and we are going to set up an experiment for hypnosis, and at the time, we're not gonna really do hypnosis, but at the time that I call for people to volunteer to be part of the hypnosis experiment, would you two raise your hands? And we're like, ah, oh, we see what's going on here. He's not gonna do a real hypnosis experience. He's gonna, he's gonna pretend the whole thing. Obviously, he probably can't do it. So, so uh, my friend volunteered us, and because I'm Afrikaans speaking, the class is Afrikaans, I was the one chosen to be the person who's gonna be hypnotized, put up my hand, and then do all kinds of things in front of 400 students in class. <laughs> Meanwhile, my friend David, 
he'll be sitting in the back of the class somewhere and he's gonna kind of be sleeping and somebody's gonna wake him up in the middle of the lecture because the professor's gonna say, some people are so susceptible to hypnotism that some of, some of your classmates may be hypnotized now. And so David, my friend, is sitting in the back and he's gonna pretend to be one of the people who happened to get hypnotized while I was being hypnotized. I don't know if you follow the story, but it's really crazy. So um, the next week we go to class and I was super nervous about this. The professor had walked me through all the different things that are gonna go, and so it happened. The professor said, who wants to be hypnotized? And I put my hand up excitedly. <laughs> um, and then he called random people. It's about half the class who was wanting to be hypnotized. I was like, whoa. So uh, he eventually shows like 13, however many people. We went to the front, and then he started this act that we had gone through. It says, okay, I'm gonna count from two, uh, you know, five to one, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that. Then you need to put it out of your hands, and then I'm gonna say, drop your hands. And so I'm standing there, a line of like 12, 13 people, and he, said, and he counts the whole thing, and we're all standing there, he's like, five, four, three, two, one, drop your hands. And everybody dropped their hands except me, because I'm hypnotized. <laughs> I'm like, okay, here we go. The show is on. And so we start going, and he says, your arms are going to start getting heavy. And, and he was talking to the class, and I don't know, like the bio, you know, biology behind this, if you, put your, if you put your arms out like this, they're going to start getting heavy, right? Because of the blood. And I'm like, no, no. He's just standing there for this long time. Anyways, we went through a couple of things. He did regression therapy, which took me to when I was a child. He had me on the floor playing with my cars. Uh, and then I went and says, now you're in uh, second grade. Go up to the blackboard and write your name. And so I had to write my name, Diavald, in like an eight-year-old kind of handwriting. Um, and that was it. And then we were done. Uh, my friend, you know, he acted and he woke up and he was hypnotized and all that kind of stuff. So that was it. You wonder why the Ministry of Healing by Alan G. White comes into the picture. David and I, we go back to Helderberg College where we lived, uh, about 30 kilometers from Stellenbosch University. And we, when we got home, we were immediately confronted by Mr. Hartweg. Our woodworking teacher from high school, a German man, with the Ministry of Healing and photocopies of all the pages that Ellen White talked about hypnotism being bad. We were like, what is going on? How does he know that we were hypnotized in class? Maybe he's the one who should need the, the Ministry of Healing just knows these kind of things. Anyways, to make a long story short, what we didn't know is that his daughter was in the same class with us. So there were three of us from a small high school that went to this massive university and were in Psychology 101. And his daughter let him know that Diavolt, myself, and David got hypnotized in class today. And Mr. Hartweg was not very happy to hear that he's Woodworking students had been hypnotized because we are Seventh-day Adventists. And the Ministry of Healing talks about the dangers of hypnotism. That was my first experience with the Ministry of Healing and the health message in Adventism. We explained to him what happened. And he was like, oh, 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 okay, okay. But still, and then he went back to the book. The health message, the Adventist health message, for many people, it is experienced as this kind of thing, where we tell people what is wrong about everything that they're doing, instead of what is right, and how we can have joyful and full lives. So today, we'll look at the health message for just a little bit, and it's based on fundamental belief number 22, which actually is called Christian behavior. It's not called the health message. It talks about how you dress, things you listen to, all those kind of things, and in, within it, it has parts about the health message. Here it is on the screen, Fundamental Belief 22. We are called to be a godly people who think, feel, and act in harmony with biblical principles in all aspects, personal and social life. For the Spirit to recreate in us the character of our Lord, we involve ourselves only in those things that will produce 
uh, Christ-like purity, health, and joy in our lives. Then it goes on to talk about beauty and dress standards and so on. And then it says, it also means that because our bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit, that we are to care for them intelligently. Along with adequate exercise and rest, we are to adopt the most healthful diet possible and abstain from unclean foods identified in scriptures. Since alcoholic beverages, tobacco, and their irresponsible use of drugs and narcotics are harmful to our bodies, we are to abstain from them as well. Instead, we are to engage in whatever brings our thoughts and bodies into the discipline of Christ, who desires our wholesomeness, joy, and goodness, with a lot of proof texts about that. And that is it. So let's look at a brief history of the health message for the Seventh-day Adventist Church, this pillar of Seventh-day Adventism. Health practices at the beginning of the 19th century in America were in fact deplorable and far from what we know and understand as normal today. Ideas of health and sickness were very, very different. Doctors and nurses had very little education Tobacco and other deadly drugs were used for medicine and very often patients bled, they were bled to death. One in six infants, in the beginning of the 1800s, one in six infants died before reaching their first birthday. The average life expectancy was about mid-30s. Little or, or nothing was known about nutrition as fruits and vegetables were largely avoided at the table. Many people here go, amen. <laughs> Much was also to be desired about hygiene during those times. Some reports claim that the average American that time seldom or never took a bath during their entire lifetime. <laughs> you. So this was all happening during the second great awakening in the United States. The reform movements happened. This was this big movement happening. And it's in this context that health reformers began to appear and appeal for new ways of healthy living. Sylvester Graham, for example, came up with his new Graham diet, teaching people uh, healthy eating habits. And then Dr. James Jackson established a water cure institute near Dansville, New York to heal patients through water and other natural methods. So this was in, it was, I was gonna say this was in the water, I shouldn't say that, it was in, in, in the Great Awakening, this was in the air. But Adventists, Adventists were forced into health discussions because of practical concerns. This cracks me up every time I think about it. While Adventists were preaching the message of Jesus' soon return, the Sabbath, the sanctuary, and the second coming, while they were preaching present truth, they themselves, the preachers, were suffering and dying because of their unhealthy lifestyles and habits. In fact, Adventism faced the potential threat of collapse because the spiritual leaders were not paying attention to their very own health. And so it is in this context that God reminded Adventists, it was not them going to the Bible, it was them because of their own experience with their ill health. It's in this context that the importance of the health message through a vision to Ellen White that she received uh, on June 9, 1863, just before the church was officially formed. And the message from God to her was simple. Health is important if we want to preach the Advent message. And we must begin to pay attention to it. And this simple idea would turn Adventism around and transform the movement in gradually becoming a leading promoter of health and healthful living. And today you and I are sit here in a Seventh-day Adventist church of Seventh-day Adventists because they paid attention to their health. So as a result, the Seventh-day Adventists would build their first medical institution called the Western Health Reform Institute in 1866. Later it became known as Battle Creek Sanitarium. The same year, uh, they also began their first health periodical magazine called The Health Reformer, and young Adventists, including John Kellogg, were also encouraged to get medical education, and today we eat Kellogg's for breakfast because of it. Later in 1905, um, through the visionary leadership of Ellen White and the help of John Burden, Adventists brought, uh, bought the property that would eventually become known as Loma Linda Sanitarium in Loma Linda, California, about a few miles away or an hour in traffic. 
Talk about the health message gone wrong. In 1906, they also started the Loma Linda College of Medical Evangelists, which eventually became known as Loma Linda University. Throughout her life, Ellen White was the channel of information that fashioned the church's philosophy uh, and emphasis on health. Uh, this is the Loma Linda Hospital um, in 1913. Long before medical evidence emerged on the dangers of smoking, for example, Ellen White spoke out strongly against this and other issues, uh, including the use of alcohol and poisonous medical medicines such as ars arsen arsenicals and mercury-based drugs, which we know today not to take. And she promoted a lacto-ova vegetarian diet as the optimal health. In 1905, Ellen White also consolidated all her counsel on health into this concise statement. Today we know it as New Start. Pure air, sunlight, abstentiousness, rest, exercise, proper diet, use of water, trust in divine power. These are true remedies. Nutrition, exercise, water, sunlight, temperance, air, rest, and trust. These principles still form the foundation of our education and practice on the health message. Today, Seventh-day Adventists have the largest Protestant health system in the world. The Seventh-day Adventist Church has uh, six medical schools, three more are being planned in the East Central Africa and South America. About 70 nursing schools and 650 hospitals, clinics, and dispensaries. Over 250,000 employees work in the various denominational health systems, which are all for nonprofit, and over 19 million outpatients and one and a half uh, million inpatients are served every year. Charity health care to the value of over $1.1 billion is extended to various communities worldwide annually. Isn't that incredible? And our holistic approach to health has made Adventist contributions to science and health education unique in the 21st century. But everything started with the simple message from God to burned out preachers. Your health is important. Today, Adventism continues to proclaim this same simple message, helping people live better and healthy lives around the world. Amen. Done? We got a little bit more to go. Here's the challenge, my friends. As we think about the health message today, in 2023, what Ellen White could have envisioned for 1860, she could not have envisioned for the 2020s. Because here's the problem. The health message has become a health industry. The health message has become a health industry. Diet, fitness, and healthcare industries do everything they can to turn a profit, to make an extra dollar, to treat us and help us and heal us. But the expense is vast. In my research, of these three uh, industries, the diet industry, fitness industry, and the health industry, in the United States alone, this is not worldwide, in the United States alone, the US dietary industry makes $78 million in profits in 2022. The US fitness industry made $33 billion in 2022. It came down during pandemic, it was much higher. In fact, it was in the 70 millions, because everybody needed to exercise all of a sudden. And then the U.S. healthcare industry makes $4.3 trillion of profit. The problem that I see in 2023 that potentially Ellen White could not have envisioned when she was preaching about you all need to be healthy is that the health message has become a health industry. And that is pro problematic. And in this country, we still to this very day have debates about whether healthcare is a right or a privilege. We are bombarded by social media. My Instagram account now, because I was researching for this sermon, has a bunch of healthcare, fitness, and diet things on it. And because I'm saying this out loud, your phones are hearing it this afternoon when you go, you will also have them. Peloton, Peloton, Peloton. Okay, maybe somebody will donate you one. Hey, friends, we're bombarded by the healthcare industry by the US diet industry and the fitness industry every single day. 
to remind us how we are not fit enough, healthy enough, good looking enough, emotionally stable enough. Just for example, now bear with me please. Here are all the diets that the, the diet industry are throwing at us. You have belief-based diets, Buddhist diet, Hindu diet, Jain diet, Islamic diet, kosher diet, and of course, the Seventh-day Adventist diet. You have the following kinds of diets. The 5-2 diet, intermittent fasting, body for life diet, cookie diet, where you eat low uh, fat cookies to qu quench your hunger. Uh, Nutrisystem diet, Weight Watchers diet, Hackers diet, Atkins diet, Dukin diet, Kim Kim diet, South Beach diet, McDougal's starch diet, Beverly Hills diet, cabbage soup diet, yeah. Grapefruit diet, monotropic diet, Subway diet, we saw that guy eat Subway. Juice fasting, master cleanse diet, dash diet, diabetic diet, elemental diet, elim elimination diet, gluten free diet, healthy kidney diet, keto diet, liquid diet, low FODMAP diet, soft diet, specific carbohydrate diet, bullet diet, drinking man's diet, Hampton's diet, Pyopi diet, protein power diet, sugar busters diet, zone diet, the four hour body diet, the F plan diet, Rice diet, the good carbohydrate revolution diet, Cambridge diet, slim fast diet, detox diet. Shall I go on? The blood type diet, the cotton ball diet. I read up on this actually, wasted time doing it, but the idea, this is a fad by the way, you freeze cotton balls and then you eat them before you eat so that you feel full. Don't try this at home, I shouldn't have said that. Immune powder diet, werewolf diet, the court werewolf diet because you eat at times when the moon is out. Uh, fruititarian diet, lacto-vegetarian diet, ovo-vegetarian, octo-vegetarian, uh, uh, vegan, flexitarian, pescatarian, pol politarianism where you eat chicken and then vegetables, kangatarian for people in kangaroo who eat only, you know, only fruits and vegetables and kangaroos. Um, Planetary diet, plant-based diet, alkaline diet, climatarian diet, hay diet, locavore diet, low-carb diet, low-fat diet, low-glycemic index diet, low-protein diet, low-sodium diet, low-sulfur diet, macrobiotic diet, Mediterranean diet, negative calorie diet, Okinawa diet, organic food diet, raw food, I'm almost done, raw food diet, slow carb diet, five-bite diet, soup diet, apple cider vinegar diet, Baby food diet, hard boiled egg diet, alkaline diet, the Daniel fast, rainbow diet, the Tom Brady di diet, Dr. Brand, engine two diet, one meal a day diet, the military diet, disassociated diet, my favorite one, a taco cleanse diet. <laughs> but the mother of all diets, the Loma Linda Foods diet. Somebody can pick this up afterwards and take it home for lunch. Friends, we're bombarded by the industry who wants to tell us we don't look good enough, we're not healthy enough, we don't eat the right thing, or we eat the wrong thing, or you need to do this and that. Of course, I didn't make the list of exhaustive fitness and uh, products and programs, so here we go. Weights and dumbbells, treadmills, no, I won't go through all that. <laughs> this is overwhelming, friends. How do we choose between all of these things? How did we go from new start and eight things to 260 plus diets that we need to choose from? Your poor doctor. It's overwhelming and while it is good to have many options, sifting through all these options is impossible. And so it's a fun way to say something we all know, we have moved from the health message to the health industry. And we're all sucked into that vortex. It leaves most of us unhappy with the way we look, feel, think about ourselves, conduct ourselves, our mental, emotional, and physical health. And that is wrong. So, what does Jesus have to say about this? I don't think Jesus could have imagined the health message becoming a health industry. 
But if we go back to our verse, Luke chapter 4, verse 46, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness and laying his hands on each of them, he healed them. The question is, why did Jesus heal people? Jesus healed people more than he taught. Why did Jesus heal more than what he preached? Were they simply acts of compassion or demonstrations of his power or proof of his divinity? And to some extent, yes, those are all true, but that is not the primary reason. If we take one of Jesus' healings in Mark chapter two as a microcosm of all his healings, we remember the story of the paralytic man whose friends brought him to Jesus while Jesus was preaching in the house of someone and they made their way through the crowds and they lowered their friend through the roof so that Jesus could heal them. And as they lower the man through the roof, Jesus doesn't focus on his paralysis, but Jesus says to the man what? Son, your sins are? Your sins are forgiven. The religious leaders are scandalized. This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. And then Jesus answered not simply with a statement, but with an action that demonstrated this statement, your, sons are, uh, your sins are forgiven. After asking whether it was easier to tell the man his sins were forgiven or to tell him to get up and walk, Jesus said, but you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. I say to you, rise, take your mat, and go home. And here Jesus' healing illustrates the power to forgive. And in a sense, this miracle is an enacted parable and all of Jesus are enacted parable. Healings are enacted parables. It points to Jesus' power to bring total spiritual healing to the life. But at the same time, it is more than simply an illustration. It not only points to spiritual healing, but it is also the partial realization of total healing that Jesus brings. And that pointing function is the primary purpose of Jesus' healing ministry. Every healing points to, to the holistic healing. This connection between physical and spiritual healing comes to the fore in, in other ways in the gospel as well. Several times after Jesus heals someone, he tells the healed person, go away, your faith has made you well. Go away, make your, uh, your faith has made you well. This happened to Bartimaeus, the woman uh, who was hemorrhaging for 12 years, and the Samaritan leper. All of them received the same good news. Go, your faith has healed you. In Jesus' words, your faith has made you well, it's very difficult to translate for, for the gospel writers seem to employ a, a, a word that is a play on words. The RSV translated it made well, but it actually has an even richer meaning of this. In a literal sense, made well means to rescue or to heal from disease, which is why we say be well at the end of our service every week. But the New Testament also uses this being well and this healing from disease in a figurative sense because it also means to save. When Matthew tells a story about a baby being born to Mary and says he should be named Jesus, Matthew says, for he will save the people from their sins. It's the very same word that is used for healing. Jesus will save them. Jesus will heal them. And so all the writers of the New Testament use this word heal and save in the same way. Go away. Your faith has made you well. Go away. Your faith has saved you. Being well and being saved are one and the same thing. Jesus does this because, here's, here's the kicker. Jesus does this because the stigma of disease and belief that many held during this time was that disease was the direct result of some great sin that this person who is sick committed. Did you follow that? The belief was that you are sick because you committed a sin. And the lepers, the blind, the infirm, the demon possessed, all the people who suffered from illness and disease were marginalized and ostracized and put outside of the community 
because of this dangerous and incorrect belief that your sins is what made you unwell. In fact, we see Jesus in John chapter 9, we see the story of a man that is um, born blind. He, he's blind from birth. And the religious leaders, the, the institution, they come and they say, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents that he was born blind? A poor infant that doesn't have any control, the religious leaders come and they say, was it this man? <laughs> Must have sinned in utero, right? <laughs> was it this man or was it his parents? And what does Jesus say? Neither. And then Jesus goes on to heal him and say, your faith has made you well, has saved you. So we see there's a connection between healing and saving, and this is at the heart of the health message of Jesus. And so we live and body and practice the health message rather than the health industry. <laughs> Because the religious leaders and the institution were practicing like they were an industry. And not a safe space for good news for those who are ill. In light of Jesus' healing ministry, I think there's three things I just briefly want to share, and then we'll be done. The first is perhaps contentious, but a journey uh, in our family that we've learned recently. Uh, with a teenager who went through an eating disorder and was institutionalized for eight, nine weeks. And with therapists encouraging us to view health as morally neutral. And so the first thing I learned from Jesus' teaching in the health message is that health is morally neutral. We see this in the characters who Jesus interacted with. Religious leaders seem to uh, set this stigmatizing on the sick. They are sick because of something they did. They are morally accountable. Even more so, they are morally judged because of what they did. For us in our healthcare system, maybe the healthcare industry is a better way of putting it, this is not too far off. When we are sick, when we don't look a certain way, when we're anxious, when we're depressed, when we're hospitalized, when we struggle with the burden of illness, we often feel that it is our fault or that we're sick because we didn't do this or we didn't do that, we didn't eat right, we didn't take the right supplements, we didn't go for a walk, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't. I recently learned about something that is called healthism. We all know that isms are usually not good. I'm going to quote extensively here from uh, a website about healthism. It's on the screens for you. Healthism refers to a set of attitudes and beliefs that health is the most important pursuit in life and that it's the personal responsibility of the individually and solely within that person's control. Those who subscribe to these beliefs view the pursuit of health, which is often conflated with thinness, as a moral good. The problem of this is that healthism doesn't acknowledge that health isn't entirely within a person's control. There are also larger biological, social, cultural, and environmental issues that contribute to poor health, such as genetics, poverty, violence, trauma, environment, environment, diet culture, and discrimination and oppression of all kinds, including ableism, racism, sexism, transphobia, homophobia, fatphobia, and weight stigma. I hope that hits you as hard as it hits me. The religious leaders blamed the people who were sick for their own sickness, and today we live in a culture and society with an industry healthism that blames the individual's health on their behavior and choices and shames the individual for not being able to do all the right things when all their efforts fail, which they inevitably do. And then the individual then is viewed as a failure and morally inferior. But friends, disease is complex and multifaceted. Like we had just read, there are many things to consider that impact health, biological, psychological, cultural, societal, And factors such as poverty, lack of access to care, racism, misogyny, transphobia, homophobia, weight stigma, trauma, fatphobia, all of these things. Healthism is the belief or attitude viewing personal health as within everybody's control solely, entirely attainable as a moral good. And as such, people are judged based on their health. Meanwhile, people who engage in deprivation such as 
by dieting, fasting, detoxing, or juice cleanses, or whatever it may be, are often viewed as good and moral. How the tables have turned. And healthism is embedded in the way you and I speak every day. Many of the things we say regarding food consumption and exercise are steeped in healthist attitudes. Here's just a few examples. Saying, I'm so bad when I eat dessert or skip going to the gym. Having to earn your meal by exercising first. Viewing certain foods as good rather than nutritious or delicious. Referring to other foods and food groups or ingredients as bad or unhealthy. Choosing foods based on calories, fat content, and carbohydrates. Referring to desirable foods as a cheat meal. Viewing exercise, fitness, and weight loss through a lens of our own willpower. Commenting on other people's body shapes, sizes, and weights. Regarding yourself as restricting or burning a certain number of uh, rewarding, sorry, yourself for restricting or burning a certain number of cal- calories, commenting on other people's me- uh, meals or behaviors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We have to fight against the idea that the health is a moral good or moral bad, depending on your behavior. I believe health is morally neutral as Jesus and his healings breaks us free from the religious and cultural institutions and the cultural norms that judge people because of their ill health. Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. And Jesus judges the very institutions that brings judgment on the sick. By the way, Ellen White has something to say about this as well. Here's a quote from her. When properly conducted, the health work is an entering wedge making a way for other truths to reach the heart. But while the health work has its place in the promulgation of the third angel's message, its advocates must not in any way strive to make it take the place of the health message, uh, of the gospel. The health message is important, but it is not the gospel. My friends, health is morally neutral. But here's the second point. Helping is not morally neutral. <laughs> Health is morally morally neutral, I believe, but helping is not morally neutral. Like I said in the scriptures, Jesus spends way more time healing people, two-thirds, than what he's teaching. There are 26 healings recorded in the Gospels. The healing of the mother of Peter's wife. The healing of the deaf mute at the Decapolis. The healing of the blind at birth. The healing of the paralytic at Bethsaida. The healing of the blind man at Bethsaida. The healing of blind man Bartimaeus. The healing of the centurion's servant. The healing of an infirm woman. Healing the man with a withered hand. Cleansing the one leper. Then cleansing the ten lepers. Healing a man with leprosy. Healing the bleeding woman. Healing the paralytic at Capernaum. Healing the Gennesaret. Healing two blind men. Healing the royal official's son. Exorcising a boy possessed by a demon. Exorcising the Canaanite woman's daughter. Exorcising the Gerasenes demoniac. Exorcising at the synagogue in Capernaum. Exorcising demons at sunset. And exorcising a mute man. And then part of the healing ministry is Jesus resurrecting a young man from Nain. Resurrecting the daughter of Jairus and resurrecting Lazarus. If it is not clear from the Gospels, I say it again, helping is not morally neutral because Jesus demonstrated us, God's own son, that the healing ministry needs to be a gospel imperative. It is not the gospel, but it is a gospel imperative. And it demonstrates more than worship or prayer or Bible study or witness can. Our true conviction that God is God of all and that God heals. That is the ministry of healing. Health is morally neutral. Helping is not morally neutral. And the last thing that I end with, we then need to ask the question, who is in need of helping? Well, we see in the Gospels, who is in need of helping? And again, we don't use helping as a looking down on people. Oh, they need help. No, no. We all need help. 
Looking down on people is judgment. Being with people is compassion. Jesus heals the marginalized, the lepers, the demon-possessed, the lame, the blind, women, children, all these people in marginalized categories during the culture of that time. Jesus seeks them out and heals them and tells them, your sins are forgiven, you are saved, you are healed. Who are the people who are marginalized and stigmatized by our health care industry? Larger bodied people, higher weighted people, people with disabilities, people of color, people of the LGBTQ plus community, and people in poverty. Those are people who need us to come alongside them. My friends, this is a systemic issue. We can do a lot on an individual level, but we also have to do it on the political level. We change our healthcare industry back into the health message. <laughs> Who is in need of help? Very proud of our La Sierra University Social Work Department. Professor Marnie Strain and Professor Daphne Thomas and others. I know and I see this every year, there's a picture um, of Marnie um, going with the students to the state capitol in Sacramento. And every year I see these pictures posted by the social work department uh, for, by our university across the street. Uh, they teach a macro social work class in our social work department, teaching students to advocate for social issues that impact marginalized and oppressed communities. And so this year with Professor Strain and others, these are some of the uh, social work students that went to the state capital to, capital to lobby as they're taught to advocate for people. So they go on a field trip to the state capital and they take part of lobbying to the politicians to make things well for others, justice and dignity and worth for every person. Marnie told me that the two things that they lobbied for this year at the state capital was State Senate Bill 407 the protection of LGBTQ foster youth, which is a growing community and a marginalized community. And the second bill they advocated for is the State Senate Bill number 11, increasing mental health services on college campuses by increasing funding for clinicians to be on campuses. Yes, Melissa, I heard you say yes. <laughs> Melissa works here. Friends, health. <laughs> Health is morally neutral. Helping is not morally neutral. Who is in need of helping? We have to individually and collectively speak up on behalf of those who need help. Because we're only as healthy as our healthiest member and we're all as sick as our sickest member. One last story, then we're done. Somebody called me, uh, don't seem here, uh, somebody texted me actually the other night, Thursday night I believe it was, um, to say that one of our church members is in dire need of help. This church member uh, is one of our older folks and um, had somehow wasn't able to get up from the floor and had spent many hours at home not able to get help. Somehow they found out about this and one of our church members texted me I think it was like 8.30 or something like that. Devo, can you help? Can pastors help or deacons or somebody like that? I'm like, we're on it, we can help. Um, this person's uh, son is in another state, couldn't connect, and so we needed someone to be there. Um, I was not able to go, and so I texted to Pastor Thread, said, can somebody please go help this individual? Pastor Elizabeth, bless her heart, it's because this, she's the new one. Um, <laughs> She said, I will go. And so at 8.30 or 9, something like that, Elizabeth, Pastor Elizabeth, went over to this church member's house. Uh, the fire department was there, and they were figuring it out. And Pastor Elizabeth went to Kaiser, to the hospital, to the emergency room where they took this person. And she was there till 1 a.m.
That's the health message. Health is, is morally neutral. Helping is not. Who is in need of helping, my friends? I leave you with a text from 3 John 2. Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you. May we have grace for ourselves and grace for others as we live and preach the health message of Jesus, not the Adventist Church, of Jesus.